Greetings, hovercraft captains! Welcome to yet another OS Nerd video. Today's video, next step 1.0a. Now, I can't actually find a release date for this. Um, it was released at some point in 1989, probably as a bug fix to 1.0, which, by the looks of things, was released in September of 1989. Now, this emulator is the same as 0.8 and 0.9. That is, it's a 25 megahertz Motorola 68030 with 64 megabytes of memory, emulating a Next computer. So uh, let's log in and see what's different between this and 0.9. So we can see that upon first glance it doesn't really look that different. The dock layout is the same, the, the same applications are on the dock. The directory browser looks the same. The workspace menu has changed. Previously in 0.9 it had WM followed by the build number and now it's just labeled workspace. Um, there are a few changes to the menu layout, uh, mostly from uh, user feedback. And the disks menu has been replaced with the optical menu because this system shipped with only the 256 megabyte magneto optical drive, no floppy, no CD-ROM, and uh, internal SCSI disks were optional. So, there are not many changes UI-wise. Most of the changes in the 1.0 release are under the hood. Changes to the underlying BSD system, the programming toolkits, um, the Mac microkernel, etc. Um, there are a few changes for the applications, but most of them are cosmetic and are most likely the result of user feedback from 0.8 and 0.9. So let's have a look at a few of the changes, starting with the Preferences app. Preferences has undergone a lot of changes since the 0.9 release, mostly with the iconography and the layout. For example, the mouse preference layout has changed, giving more space for the mouse speed and the double-click delay. Um, the handedness has changed to just two simple buttons underneath a picture of the mouse. And I don't know what this thing is, but I don't like it. Um, it's a toggle button between enabled and disabled. This didn't last long for obvious reasons. The keyboard preferences has changed. Um, the screen preferences now uses the universally recognized symbols for brightness and volume rather than images of the sound box and the display, which might have led to a confusion had people not been aware of the sound box actually inside the monitor. The general preferences has changed. Now it is actual general preferences rather than um, Unix preferences. Uh, the time preferences, you can actually change the time zone. And the, 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 the method of editing the time is actually a lot better now. You select which one you want to edit, whether or not it's the hours, minutes, or what have you, and just use the buttons to change them. The password option is the same. The power option, this was the startup option. Um, so in this release, it's pretty much the same. You can choose whether or not to boot from the hard disk, the magneto optical disk, or the network. And now the Unix preferences and the more advanced stuff is underneath its own preference pane. So that's pretty much it for the uh, preferences application. The mail application has changed a little as well. The menu has undergone some changes, as well as some of the windows and dialogues. For example, um, if I click send here quickly, um, the reply and reply all button are now merged, and the new mail button has been replaced with a clear button. I would imagine this is because people, you know, after typing their huge email, um, suddenly noticed that there was a new mail button and they clicked it thinking it would open up a new send window when it just clears everything that they've edited in the existing email, um, which I'd imagine probably caused a lot of angry emails to be sent to Steve Jobs saying, you cannot UI, what's going on, fix your stuff. So if I just move the send window out of the way and get back to the mailbox, if I click on this email from root and I go back to the send window, um, the way the reply all button works is if I click it once, 
you reply to the person that sent you the email. If I click it again, it will reply to everyone who was a recipient of that email. If I then change my mind, I can click it again and it will go back to replying to just the person that sent me the email. Now the other thing you might notice is this little picture by here. This is a feature that's been in the system since 0.8, but I couldn't demo it because mail wouldn't work for me on 0.8 and I couldn't get any TIFF images onto 0.9. So this is a mail image. Um, there is a directory on the file system. Under 0.8 it is boot disk images people. Under 0.9 it is local library images people. And it stayed as local library images people all the way through to OpenStep 4.2. And basically you can assign a image to either a user or a male alias and when you view email from that user it will display their picture here in the top right. So yeah, mail.app has undergone a few changes, mostly with the menu and the, um, the send window. Um, there's not much else worth showing, so I'll just quit out of this. Right now is pretty much the same. Webster's has got a few minor changes that aren't worth showing. Librarian has had some large changes which are worth showing. So as we can see here, the list of topics under which you can search are now underneath the search bar. So for example, if I wanted to look in the next manuals, I don't know, for, I don't know, let's say the malloc C library call. And it would then give me the results underneath. And again, because these are all right now documents, um, if I click on one, it will then load right now. Later on, documentation was all in rich text format, so Librarian could provide its own viewer. And here we can see it's loaded up and gone to the first instance of the phrase malloc in this file, which in this case is allocating a mutex, which I'm sure many people are going to find fascinating. So, the next application that's undergone many changes is Interface Builder. I'm not going to talk too much about Interface Builder because, as I've said in previous videos, Interface Builder is sufficiently complicated to warrant its own set of videos. Um, the one thing I will say, however, is with the 1.0 release, Interface Builder kind of takes on its final form. So, for example, if I go and create a new application, it will load up the application project window uh, which contains various bits and pieces so with this you get a uh, info panel you get a main menu object and you get the default window object you also get the first responder um, various icon resources sound resources and an objective c class browser that lets you create and edit class definitions that are then written out to Objective C files. Don't worry if you don't understand any of this, I will be doing a whole series of videos covering Interface Builder and perhaps maybe some of their clones such as Visual Basic. So yes, this interface layout with the inspector, with the palette windows, um, with the project windows, this pretty much stayed the same all the way through to Interface Builder on Rhapsody and early OS X. So that's Interface Builder. Now I don't really think there's anything else worth demoing. Um, let's see, we have the uh, the DSP debugger. Um, the one thing worth showing, however, is FrameMaker, which uh, is no longer alpha in this release. It is, in fact, beta. Um, this is a time-limited demo of FrameMaker um, for which one could purchase a license for use. Even though it is beta quality, it is still fairly usable. Here we can see that the beta version expires in October 89. I currently have the date set to February 89, so everything should be good. Um, actually, let's go back to the info panel and open the demo document. And there we have it, the demo document. To be honest, FrameMaker is, is actually quite a nice application. 
I would consider it to be one of the killer applications on the next along with Lotus Improv and Adobe Illustrator. Well, let's just see, is there any other demos worth showing? Not really. Um, highly recommend you, you grab previous and if you can um, an image of Next Step 1.0 and have a play of it yourself because there is a lot of stuff in here. Um, is there any other applications to cover? Not really, no. The administration tools in this release um, are pretty much where most of the major changes happen application-wise, actually. Um, the first application that was added was this mail manager application, although, to be fair, it doesn't really do much. As we can see, there are two options update picture database and make mail server the update picture database command if I just go to local library images people and then double click on this file here um, this button updates this file um, so this basically is a listing of the system accounts in the password file in Etsy and user accounts in NetInfo. it does have security implications however because this is my cryptid password so you could go and grab this file and then, I don't know, grab John the Ripper and then break everyone's password and become famous. Um, this wasn't really dealt with until later on, um, although any administrator worth his or her salt would go in and just replace this with a star. Because this file is not used for authentication, it's just used to map uh, Unix users to their user picture. Oh, and as we can see, the menu layout of edit has changed, but edit's pretty much the same, so I'm not going to bother showing that. The make mail server button here, um, this configures the machine as the mail server for a netinfo domain. So if you have more than one next cube um, on a domain with netinfo, you just click on this and um, it then goes and configures the mail server for you. So there isn't really much for that application. Let's go back to next admin. One of the ones that's changed a lot is NetInfo Manager. So as we can see here, NetInfo Manager is now a clone of the directory browser. Um, editing NetInfo is a case of going um, down the directories, finding the element you want to edit, double clicking on it, and it will come up with the property editor. In this case, it is the user details for the demo user. You can then make your edits and then save it to the NetInfo domain. You can also um, open, I think. Let's see, can you actually open the parent domain from this? Yes, you can. You can open parent domains and local domains, etc. Now, NetInfo Manager itself went through several revisions after this, so this isn't how it would look in 2.0 for example. Next we have Net Manager. Uh, Net Manager basically lets you configure two things. Firstly it lets you con configure the local networking settings for the machine. So for example I can configure the network type, uh, the host name, IP address, net mask, etc etc. I can also enable configuration server which will turn this machine into a net info master. Now as well as doing that I can edit hosts. Now what that means is um, whenever a new next step machine is added to the network the first thing it will do is try and find the net info master to pull down its configuration. Let's add a new host, let's call it, I don't know, um, let's call it Marika. Uh, let's give it the IP address 10.10.1.1 and Ethernet address, I don't know, let's just go and edit it to uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 6. So what will happen now when I save this, when, this, when the new machine is added, um, when it makes its request to NetInfo, uh, the NetInfo master will look at the MAC address, it will find this host name Marika, and then it will send the host name, the IP address, and various other bits and pieces uh, to the machine so the machine can configure its networking. If I didn't have the MAC address, then the machine will say, hey look, I don't know 
what machine this is, pre please provide the host name. I'd type in Mariko as the host name. It would then go and match this and then pull the configuration details, etc. This also supports diskless workstations or FIN clients um, that boot via Netboot, uh, BootP. Um, etc. So this interface um, eventually became host manager and it became a lot better in later versions of, of uh, the next step system. No, let's not save changes. And finally we have the user manager. I'm skipping print tester um, because that just lets you print test pages. There's nothing really exciting there because I don't have a printer. And the update application, that is what you'd run to up update a 1.0 system to 1.0a. So there's no point in showing that. So the user manager basically lets you add users. Um, if you then go to view and long, this also lets you edit users. Um, this again became a lot better in later revisions, but this is a lot easier than creating new users by going into um, the NetInfo manager, creating a new directory for the user, and then having to create each individual property for that user one at a time. So that's pretty much it for Next Step 1.0a. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and as always, if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to leave them below. Thank you very much for watching, and see you next time.